Yokohama, 1898. The first moving images ever filmed in Japan. Thomas Edison and other pioneers of the moving image had brought their amazing new technology to Japan a year earlier. Previously timeless, mysterious and isolated, Japan is beginning to transform itself. Takeshi Endo, a retired school teacher, I remember the time before Shogun Tokugawa Yoshinobu and the absolute rule of the samurai. Everything is changing so quickly now. For my liking, far too quickly and too much. Since the end of the Tokugawa Shogunate and the restoration of the power of the Emperor Meiji in 1868, Japan has become a place of commercial and cultural fascination for the West. But it has also been flexing its own muscles on mainland Asia. Japan had waged war against China in 1894 in dispute over the control of Korea. Japan's imperial forces overwhelmed those of the Chinese emperor who sued for peace. In the Treaty of Shimonoseki, signed in April 1895, China had recognized the total independence of Korea and ceded Taiwan to Japan in perpetuity. It was Japan's first step on the road to imperial glory, a path that would be fleetingly triumphant, but would in just 50 years lead to catastrophe and humiliation. Japan's holy war, Seisen. Siberia, December 1904. Troops from Japan's Third Army under General Maresuke Nugi are preparing for the final assault on the Russian Imperial garrison. The Russians have held out for five months. Losses on both sides have been huge. Japan sends 16,000 reinforcements and heavy artillery. Japanese sappers start to dig into the hillsides to plant huge explosives. The hills around Port Arthur fall one by one, leading the Japanese to celebrate an historic breakthrough. The Russian Pacific Fleet in harbor is now vulnerable to artillery attack. Nogi deploys his 11-inch Krupp howitzers, capable of hurling 500-pound shells over 15 miles. The Russian commander, General Stosel, surrenders, giving Japan a remarkable victory. Stosel is escorted into captivity on his white horse, along with 25,000 of his men. The Russian prisoners are treated with kindness and dignity by Nogi and his men. Nogi then marches his army to Mukden, where they inflict another crushing defeat on the Russians.
Later in the same year, the Tsar's Baltic fleet arrives in the Straits of Tsushima. It has sailed 18,000 nautical miles to reach the Far East, where it confronts the might of the Japanese Navy under Admiral Togo. Japanese Imperial Navy inflicts a crushing defeat on the Tsar's fleet, sinking 21 of the Russians' 28 ships and seven of its eight battleships. Togo returns to Tokyo as the conquering hero. He is greeted by Emperor Meiji at the Imperial Palace. Then the two heroes of the war against Russia are united. Admiral of the fleet, Hiachiro Togo, and General of the Army, Marusuke Nogi. Journalist Saburo Katsura describes the scenes in Tokyo. The whole city turned out to celebrate. A major Western power has been brought to its knees. We were proud to be Japanese. Now we can move on to take our place as a first-class nation in the eyes of the world. The Usuri River, Siberia, 1918. The Bolshevik Revolution in Russia and subsequent civil war has led the United States and the European powers to support a Japanese and Allied expeditionary force to secure eastern Siberia against the communist threat. The mission is to protect the Trans-Siberian Railway at Khabarovsk and seize huge stockpiles of supplies and munitions. The incursion will provide a major Asian bridgehead for Japan for several years to come. They also relieve Cossack troops and the Czech Legion who have been fighting the Bolsheviks' Red Army from the Ukraine to the Pacific. Japanese Lieutenant General Oi, leading Japan's 12th Division, hosts Colonel Henry Steyer, commander of the US 27th Infantry, the Wolfhounds, part of the American Expeditionary Force, much admired by the Japanese and their Bolshevik enemies. General Oi enjoys a cigar with his staff officers. US Colonels Murrow and Robinson relax in the wintry sun, while the Allies exercise and fraternize together, following their rout of the Red Army. In just 25 years, the roles will be reversed. The United States and the Soviet Union will join forces to defeat the rise of fascism. And Japan and the United States will engage in a ferocious fight to the death across the Pacific. Seoul, Korea, 1924. Invigorated by its success against Russia in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, Japan had turned its attention to control of the Korean Peninsula, the isolationist Hermit Kingdom. Effectively under Japanese control for several years, Korea had been formally annexed as part of the Japanese Empire in 1910. It immediately began to suppress the Korean language and culture and exploit its people and resources, a state of affairs that would last for 35 years.
by the end of World War II, there will be over 850,000 Japanese living in Korea. Tokyo, spring, 1925. It is cherry blossom time, a time for renewal and optimism. Japan is now a strange mix of the modern and traditional. In this spring festival, there is traditional dress, but most of the men wear western strobotas or cloth caps. These innovations do not meet with the approval of many Japanese. The diary of Yotaro Inaka, a civil servant. Why do we adopt these American fashions? We have our own culture. We should respect it. Japan's towns and cities are becoming more and more affluent, especially through the growing influence of American goods and lifestyle. of foreigners, especially Americans, is resented by traditionalists. Retired engineer Mitsuru Oyama. The rich are getting richer and acting like Yankees. They bring disgrace to our people. In the countryside, the vast majority of Japanese live like they have for centuries, in a state of humble self-sufficiency often bordering on abject poverty. Rice, tea and silk are vital to survival. The work is backbreaking. Fertilizer brought from the towns in the form of human waste feeds the crops. Life is ageless and simple and appears to be untroubled and tranquil. But beyond the rustic scene, there are dark clouds on the horizon. The US Congress had passed legislation a year earlier prohibiting Japanese and other Oriental immigration into the United States. The move is deeply resented in Japan. Yotaro Inaka. The Americans come to Asia and act like they are superior to us. But they have no honor, no respect. They treat us like second-class human beings and refuse us entry to their country. Closer to home, Japan's interests in China are being threatened by the rise of the Kuomintang under General Chiang Kai-shek. Dalian, Manchuria, 1931. The Ural Maru arrives from Osaka, carrying comfort parcels for Japanese troops in Manchuria, one of several foreign garrisons in China. Parcels are provided by newspaper giant Asahi and are part of a propaganda campaign engineered by right-wing elements in the Japanese military. In order to generate a wave of nationalist fervor at home, the parcels are delivered in person by Asahi's director, Harada, and a posse of journalists, photographers, and newsreel cameramen. Some are not convinced by the propaganda. Journalist Ken Iwasaki. What is going on is dangerous. The fanatics in these secret societies, like the black dragons, are dragging us into war. But nobody is brave enough to stand up to them. Japan has been expanding its interests in China and Manchuria for years. The South Manchuria Railway, vital to Japan's interests, is used to transport the parcels to Mukden, the headquarters of Japan's presence in Manchuria. Lieutenant Iweo 
Okubo, stationed in Mukden. We must take control ourselves. If we wait for Tokyo, nothing will happen. It is our duty to act decisively in the interests of our homeland. It is our destiny. An audacious plan is being hatched by nationalist elements within the army, acting beyond the control of high command in Tokyo and without the sanction of the emperor, Itaro Inaka. We must defend our interest in China. Japan cannot feed itself or get the raw materials for its industry. Without a strong presence on the Asian mainland and throughout Southeast Asia. September 1931, Mukden, China. Two army colonels, Seishiro Itagaki and Kanji Ishiwara, have devised a plan to ignite war in Manchuria. On the morning of September 19th, two artillery pieces, installed in secret at the Mukden Officers Club, open fire on the Chinese garrison nearby. The Japanese army is moved into position in large numbers, and reinforcements arrive from the Japanese garrison in Korea. At first, Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek orders his army to fall back and Japan occupies Chancheng and Antung with ease. Only in November do the Chinese attack, leading to intense fighting for several weeks. Iweo Ukubo. The generals were not brave enough to make this move, but we showed them how to fight in the true Japanese tradition, with spirit, swiftly and decisively. The Chinese army is ill prepared for battle, and the country is beset by internal political wrangling and the effects of severe flooding in the valley of the Yangtze River. <laughs> Japan's army makes rapid progress, sweeping across Manchuria's wide open spaces. It was exciting. Nothing could stop us. Our supply lines became longer and longer. But HQ kept us going with excellent backup. We despised the Chinese for not fighting with more courage. Within five months of the Mukden incident, the Imperial Japanese Army overruns all major towns and cities in the provinces of Liaoning, Jilin, and Heilongjiang. United States Secretary of State Henry Stimson declares that the United States will not recognize any government that is established as a result of Japanese actions in Manchuria. A League of Nations commission, headed by British diplomat Earl Lytton, rejects the Japanese claim that the Manchurian invasion and occupation was an act of self-defense. The League of Nations later refuses to acknowledge Japan's claims, and in 1933, it resigns from the League. Journalist Akira Yamaguchi. It is typical of the hypocrisy of the Western powers. They have had a colonial presence here in Asia for centuries. They call it benign partnership or some other euphemism. But when we Japanese do the same, they call it naked aggression and condemn us. The port of Mukden is secured for Japanese shipping 
and for Japan's commercial interests to begin to exploit the new territory. Koki Ashida, a businessman from Yokohama. At last, we have open spaces to expand into. We have natural resources, land for agriculture, and labor to put to work. Now, we can flex our muscles. Kyoko Yamashita, a schoolteacher, travels to Manchuria with her husband in 1932. At first, I was carried along with the excitement of our victory. But the more time I spent with the Manchu people, the more I realized how much they resented our presence. We weren't liberating them from Western oppression. We were just replacing one sort of colonial rule for another. Japan begins to create a puppet state controlled from Tokyo. The last emperor of China, Puyi, is invited to come with his followers and act as the head of state for Manchuria. On February 18, 1932, the Manchu state of Manchuko is proclaimed. The city of Changchung becomes the capital of the new entity. Two years later, Puyi is declared emperor of Manchuko, but is nothing more than a figurehead, and real authority rests in the hands of the Japanese military officials. Japan formally detaches Manchukuo from China in the course of the 1930s. And with Japanese investment in its rich natural resources, the area eventually becomes an industrial powerhouse. Throughout the 1930s, vast numbers of Japanese settlers migrate to find a new life. Propaganda films depict Manchukuo as a paradise of peace and harmony. Koki, Ashida. This is our Australia. Like the British, we need room for our people. Nobody complains about the British settling in Australia. So what's wrong with us moving here? Besides, look at the progress we are making. It is a new country. The Chinese should be thankful instead of complaining. Manchuko is portrayed as a new Japan. Economic turmoil and the impact of the global depression following the Wall Street crash of 1929 plunges Japan into turmoil and introspection. Many lose faith in parliamentary democracy and ultra-nationalist groups begin to form among the junior officer ranks of the army. Mitsuro Oyama. The zaibats like Mitsubishi who control our industry need to be taught a lesson. They have grown too fat. 
The politicians are corrupt and bringing disgrace to the Diet. Only the Emperor deserves our respect. We should restore his supreme power so that we have discipline and pride at home and a new empire overseas. Conditions worsen when American demand for silk collapses because of the depression. There is great hardship in rural Japan, especially in the north, the main recruiting ground for the army. Mitsuru Oyama. It is unbearable. In my district, families are so poor, they are selling their daughters to the tea houses. They dress them like geishas, but they are just prostitutes in Brussels. What has become of our people? It has to stop. Japanese attitudes harden in spring 1932. On April 29th, Yoon Bong Gil, a Korean nationalist protesting at the Japanese control of his country, carries out a bomb attack at a Japanese army celebration of Emperor Hirohito's birthday in Hongku Park, Shanghai. The bomb kills Yoshinori Shirakawa, a general of the Imperial Japanese Army, and Sadaji Kawabata, the government chancellor of Japanese residents in Shanghai. It also seriously injures several others. Yoon is arrested at the scene and convicted by a Japanese military court and later executed. The emperor, Hirohito, who had ascended the chrysanthemum throne in 1926, is concerned about growing army interference. The army is meddling in domestic and foreign politics, and its general willfulness is a state of affairs which, for the good of the nation, we must view with apprehension. The emperor's anxieties are well founded. 1932. Shanghai, China. Instigated by local Japanese military, fighting breaks out between the Chinese army and the Japanese navy stationed in the city. The world is shocked by one of the earliest examples of the aerial bombing of cities, as Japanese planes attack the Chepei district of Shanghai. It also witnesses how Japan's troops treat their captives. The honor and respect shown their enemies in 1905 have gone. In the ensuing battle, the Chinese hold their ground. Unable to retrieve the situation despite reinforcements from the fleet, the Japanese Navy has to call on the army for help. The High Command in Tokyo organizes a fully-fledged Shanghai Expeditionary Force under General Shirakawa and reinforces it with two full divisions. Intense fighting ensues. The Chinese finally fall back. Japan is able to announce a face-saving ceasefire, followed by an armistice. Although the Japanese are surprised by the resolve of the Chinese, the ferocious reputation of the Japanese soldier begins to spread. Captured by the Chinese in February 1932, Captain Kuga Naboru is returned to Japan in a prisoner exchange. He commits suicide to atone for his capture. Lauded for his martial spirit by Army Minister Araki, Kuga is later enshrined at the soldier's tomb in Yaskuni. From this time on, officers who survived battle are openly pressured to commit suicide. January 1933, the Chumenko Pass, gateway to the Chinese province of Jehol, 
close to the Great Wall of China. Operation Neca. Japan is attempting to add Jay Hall to its new entity, Manchuko. Once again, the Japanese military creates a minor incident and uses press propaganda to justify its actions. Japanese newspaper, the Miyako Shimbun. Japan's action to prevent the Chinese from entering Jehol and violating the security of Manchuko is a necessary measure of self-defense. Emperor Hirohito approves the campaign, but insists that the Imperial Army goes no further than the Great Wall. The civilian population flees in terror in the face of the advancing Japanese army. Chinese General Ho Chu Kuo's celebrated 9th Brigade forms part of the Chinese line, but they are armed only with light artillery pieces and small arms. Nevertheless, they fight for over three months to keep the Japanese at bay. Haritomo Yoshida, an officer in the Imperial Army. My respect for the Chinese grew and grew. They had few weapons and no tanks or heavy artillery, but they held us for a long period. The terrain of Jay Hall makes the fighting an unusual mix of old and new military techniques. takes place in the depths of winter in atrocious conditions. Aritomo Yoshida. I have never been so cold. We had two enemies, the Chinese and winter. Winter was the most difficult to fight. We only had to face the Chinese from time to time. We had to face winter every day. On March 4th, Chengdi, the provincial capital, falls, and in May, a truce is declared at Tanggu, handing Japan a vast new province to add to its empire. <laughs> Japan's empire now stretches to the Great Plains of Central Asia and the peoples of Mongol descent, famed for their horsemanship and martial prowess. Over a hundred thousand men took part in the campaign, with heavy casualties on both sides. It is estimated that China's losses were over 10,000. There were over 5,000 Japanese dead and injured. Manami Hayato, a nurse at a military hospital in Yokohama. Some of the boys paid a terrible price. Apart from the usual awful wounds, Many suffered from frostbite. They lost fingers and toes. How will they work? Their only chance is that their families will look after them. Throughout the 1930s, Japan quickly recovers from worldwide economic depression and begins to grow rapidly. Hidetoshi Toyotomi, a businessman. We are doing well. People work hard, but we need more resources if we are to match the Americans and the Europeans. We need coal, oil, and minerals. 
Not only that, our farmers can't keep pace with our growing population. We need cheap food supplies, and everyone knows where they are. Its economy grows by 5% per annum, and between 1929 and 1937, its gross domestic product increases by 50%. Steel production rises from 6 million tonnes to nearly 9 million tonnes. By 1941, Japan's aircraft industry is able to produce 10,000 aircraft per year. Much of this economic expansion benefits the old Zaibatsu, large industrial conglomerates like Mitsui and Mitsubishi, which grow closer and closer to the Japanese military. And the new Zaibatsu, like Nissan and Toyota, which are booming from vehicle manufacture and producing military hardware. Japan's people have a strong sense of personal and national discipline. A rigid education system teaches the cardinal principles of the nation. It defines Japan and the duties of its people in very precise terms. The unbroken line of emperors reign eternally over the Japanese empire. This is our eternal and immutable national entity. Thus founded on this great principle, all the people, united as one great family, obeying the imperial will, enhance the beautiful virtue of loyalty and piety. This is the glory of our nation. The emperor is a deity incarnate, a living god and serving him is seen as the duty of every citizen. Individuals must sacrifice their identity for the sake of the emperor and the nation. Japanese diplomat Tatsuo Kawai, writing about the Japanese philosophy of Musubi. The history of the Japanese people is a record of our faith in nature. The harmonization of our people with the forces of nature. Preserve nature and rediscover oneself. So teaches the philosophy of Musubi. Following the dictates of Musubi, Japan will restore a degenerate China and the rest of Asia. Armed with ideas like Musubi, 1930s Japan steals itself with a missionary zeal to liberate Asia from its immoral slumber and oppression by the West. And just in case anyone should resist these potent ideas, Japan's secret police, the Kempitai, maintains a reign of terror against dissidents. Yotaro Nagata a doctor. I have heard what is happening in the cities with the Kempe Tai. Although I don't support open dissent, people should be allowed to think for themselves. The old samurai would never have tolerated these young hotheads, who seems to be running the army now. What has happened to honor? Park, Tokyo, April 1937. Cherry blossom time, a long standing tradition in Japan. This is the earliest example of color film shot in Japan. The footage is on 16mm Kodachrome, a newly released film stock developed for home movie enthusiasts. 
It is shot by American military attaché at the US Embassy in Tokyo, William Carey Crane, who will later become a brigadier general in the US Army. The images depict endearing scenes of a tranquil country in harmony. But they are deceptive. They hide internal turmoil and disguise a nation hell-bent on a relentless course that will lead to catastrophic global conflict and to its own terrifying demise. The brief life of the blossom, Sakura, symbolizes the transient nature of human life and is used to inspire Japan's warriors. The Sakurakai is the name chosen by young Japanese officers for their secret society devoted to creating a military state. Japan's soldiers are expected, like myriad cherry blossoms, to scatter in the wind and die. Kyoko Endo, a Tokyo housewife, writes to her husband, an officer in the 35th Regiment, stationed in China. I went to see the beautiful blossom today with our daughter. It is the first time we have done that without you. I wish this fighting in China would end so that you can come home. Tokyo seems so peaceful and everyone looks happy, but many are hiding their feelings. If you ask why are we going on these adventures in foreign countries, people turn away. They don't want to talk. Those people who disagree with what's going on are arrested. It's not right. Ten days after sending her letter, Kyoko is arrested by the Kempeitai. She is interrogated for three days and has to give them the details of all her friends and family and those of her husband. <laughs> Lieutenant Endo, Kyoko's husband, never replies to her letter. He is killed in China. Japan is firmly in the grip of those who want war. There seems to be nothing to them. They believe it will bring Japan glory and power and its rightful place in the world. But within a decade, they will be tragically disillusioned. Kyushu, southern Japan, 1935. A tranquil rural scene, peaceful and ageless. But all is not as it seems. The diary of Yotaro Nagata, a rural doctor from Kyushu. about our nation. We seem to be rushing headlong into the future, but so many are being left behind. The old, the young. What about our way of life? The cities seduce everyone with their cars and western clothes. No good will come of it. For the past 40 years, Japan has been in the midst of internal strife. Its military elite is more and more aggressive, and its forces have waged war with increasing success on the Asian mainland, with large areas of Korea 
Manchuria and China under its control. Over the next 10 years, Japan will escalate its ambitions into global conflict. Japan's holy war, say Sen. March 1936, a new government in Tokyo dramatically increases military spending and decrees that only serving generals and admirals can become Navy and Army ministers. In November, Japan signs the Anti-Comintern Pact with Nazi Germany and later with Mussolini's fascist Italy. The world is forming itself into armed camps, and Japan is ready to strike. Shigenori Oda, a training officer with the Imperial Army. We were ready. The recruits were raw, but they were enthusiastic, and we got them into shape. Most were young country boys, or poor kids from the poor district of the cities. They were very naive, they thought war was like the stories their grandfathers told them. Samurai heroes fighting with their swords for the oppressed. I felt sorry for them. Machine guns and mortars are very different. By 1937, the army has grown to 34 divisions. Over 300,000 men and its navy has four aircraft carriers, 10 battleships, and over 30 cruisers. The inevitable war against China begins in July, 1937. Masumi Takahashi watches her young son go off to war. fight, do his best for the emperor, to die if necessary. He had been told that it was his duty. I couldn't say anything. It wouldn't have done any good. I never saw him again. They said he died bravely in China. I would have preferred it if he had run away. Then I would still have him with me. July 1937, in what becomes known as the Marco Polo Bridge incident, a small skirmish near Beijing quickly escalates into all-out war. The Imperial Army prepares to meet Chiang Kai-shek's Chinese Nationalist Army. They are not as well equipped or as well trained as the Japanese, but they do not lack the will to fight. Fighting spreads to Shanghai by August. Carnage follows as Japan pours in troops from its garrisons in Korea and Manchukuo.
Eventually, over a million men are involved in vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting, street by street. Civilians caught up in the fighting are desperate to leave the city. Within days, Japan launches a massive second wave of attacks from sea and air. in from Manchuko, Lieutenant Iweo Okubo. We made amphibious landings where all our training paid off. We went ashore in large numbers. The reality of war was frightening and exciting at the same time. The Chinese were much better organized. They fought well. It took us a long time, house by house, block by block, to gain ground. It was the worst fighting I can remember. exact a heavy price from innocent civilians. Yoshi Matsui, a Marine with the Special Naval Landing Force. I will never forget those terrible scenes. This wasn't war between fighting men. It was like a slaughterhouse. Old men, women, and children. We were told we are bringing liberty to our Asian brothers. All I could see was death and destruction, and from them, barely disguised hatred. In Japan, recruitment to the army is escalating. There is no shortage of young men willing to fight. Kaito Shimura, a student from Tokyo. We heard about the victories in China. We were so proud of the army, but we all wanted to join them as soon as possible and worked as hard as we could with our training. But not everyone is keen to see Japan's young men go off to war. Kaito Shimura's mother, Ai. I understand that young men need to show off their strengths and courage but why do they have to go to war in a far off country? In my father's time, men challenged one another in kendo or judo. They don't have to die in battle to prove that they are brave. The Japanese government and military high command in Tokyo is now finding it difficult to control the Imperial Army's generals in China. They have almost 400,000 men under their command. Galvanized by their victories, their troops regard themselves as invincible, waging a holy war, Sei Sen, for their emperor, Iweo Okubo. Nothing could stop us. Our history, our courage, our pride gave us strength. We felt like supermen. There was a lot of talk among the men about going south to fight the French and the British and even the Americans. We weren't frightened of anyone. After prolonged fighting and heavy casualties, Shanghai falls to the Japanese army in November 1937. The Imperial Army now focuses its attention on Nanking, the Chinese capital.
Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek, realizing that he will be unable to hold the city, evacuates his elite troops and leaves a largely untrained force to defend the city and its inhabitants. Reports begin to circulate of Japanese troops looting and burning as they approach Nanking. Thousands of Chinese civilians flee the city. An offer of surrender is rejected by Chiang Kai-shek and Japanese General Iwane Matsui orders that the city be taken by force. attacks from all directions on the city's walls, Nanking falls within days. <coughs> what follows becomes one of the most horrific and contentious incidents in history. Over a six-week period, countless examples of beheading, rape, mutilation and looting are witnessed by Chinese and Western survivors in the city. Civilians, men, women and children are treated as harshly as military personnel. An American missionary and chairman of the local Red Cross Association, John McGee, manages to secretly record some of the horrors on 16mm film. It is the only footage known to have survived. Although post-war Japanese governments will subsequently apologize for the atrocities committed in Nanking, the scale and extent of the horrors remain a source of dispute and bitterness. Chinese authorities suggest as many as 300,000 are killed. The estimate given by the International Military Tribunal for the Far East is 200,000. Japanese sources vary. Some historians admit to tens of thousands of deaths. Others claim that the incidents are exaggerated for propaganda purposes and that only a few hundred isolated examples occur. General Iwani Matsui, who will be executed for war crimes after the war, is reported to have later confided in one of his aides. My men have done something very wrong and extremely regrettable. I now realize that we have wrought a most grievous crime on this city. I am personally very sorry for the tragedy suffered by the people. I offer my sympathy with great sadness to a million innocent people. In stark contrast to the scenes of horror in China, newsreels show Japan as a haven of tranquility in the countryside and in the midst of boom and affluence in the towns and cities. But the tide of nationalism is still strong and when it is reported that the Western powers are providing vital supplies to the Chinese forces, the Japanese regard this as an act of aggression. The mood of belligerence is made even worse when the Western powers deny Japan access to raw materials, particularly oil. The press refer to it as the ABCD encirclement, American, British, Chinese, Dutch, and the people bitterly resent it. 
schoolmaster Risuke Kawamura. They are surrounding us and they support China by providing weapons. This will lead to war. Japan's leaders come to the conclusion that they face economic catastrophe unless they take what is being denied to them by force of arms. Planning for war against the Western powers begins in spring 1941. Yoichi Yanagida, a student. Call-ups to the military are increasing. We seem to be on the edge of an abyss. When will that moment arrive? The morning of December 8th, 1941, Tokyo time. A date that is often referred to in the US time zone as December 7th. Japan initiates an audacious plan, Operation Hawaii, a surprise attack out of the bright blue skies of a Pacific morning. It will be remembered by both sides forever. The attack is led by Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, a liberal opposed to the war in China and the pact with fascist Germany and Italy he is a target for assassination by ultra-nationalists. Nevertheless, his warrior spirit is obvious from his writings. To die for emperor and the nation is the highest hope of a military man. After a brave hard fight, the blossoms are scattered on the fighting field. One man's life or death it's a matter of no importance. All that matters is the empire. As Confucius said, one may burn a fragrant herb, yet it will not destroy the scent. They may destroy my body, yet they will not take away my will. A massive armada catches the US Pacific fleet unawares at anchor in Pearl Harbor. Fifty-three planes, launched from six aircraft carriers, bombard the American ships relentlessly for over two hours. For the loss of just 29 aircraft, five midget submarines, and 65 servicemen killed or wounded, four U.S. naval battleships are sunk, four others damaged. Three cruisers, three destroyers, an anti-aircraft training ship, and one mine layer are also sunk. 188 US aircraft are destroyed, 2,400 Americans killed, and almost 1,300 wounded. The new Prime Minister, General Hideki Tojo. The key to success lies in faith in victory. In the 2,600 years since it was founded, our empire has never known defeat. It is time for the hundred million of us Japanese to dedicate ourselves and sacrifice everything for our country's cause. Housewife Tei Fujiwara. I was so surprised at the news. I jumped around our garden with my baby, shouting, Oh God, let us put all our faith in the army. Yoshitaka Kojima a 12-year-old schoolboy. I heard the footstep of our teacher coming into the room. I was class leader, and I gave the order to stand and bow. He said, Japan has started the war against the United States. All of us were so excited, we just clapped our hands with joy. The attack is intended as a preventative action. 
sought to stop the US Pacific Fleet from interfering with military strikes the Empire of Japan is about to unleash against the overseas territories of the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, France, and the United States in Southeast Asia. Despite the euphoria at home, Japan's military leadership has made a fundamental error. Not only has the attack on Pearl Harbor failed to destroy the US Pacific Fleet's three aircraft carriers safely out of harm's way in the Pacific, they have also incurred the wrath of the United States and its people on a day that US President Roosevelt calls a date that will live in infamy. In retaliation, the Americans will exact a very high price from Japan. The remaining weeks of 1941 and the first few months of 1942 bring a succession of dramatic Japanese victories and a huge expansion in its empire. Kong falls within days of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Thailand soon follows, as do the cities of Manila and Kuala Lumpur, and in February, Singapore. By May, the Dutch East Indies has surrendered, as has the Philippines. As news of more and more victories came in, we felt so proud. At last, we were a first-class nation and could look Westerners in the eye as equals. On May 20th, the Imperial Army reaches the Indian border, bringing Japan control of the whole of Southeast Asia. It enjoys naval dominance of the Pacific and Indian Oceans and the complete isolation of Australia and New Zealand. Japan's military strategy anticipates that at this point it will, from its position of considerable strength, take up a defensive posture and await the Western powers' request for a negotiated settlement. The Prime Minister, General Hideki Tojo. We made our plans in such a manner that should there be progress through diplomatic means, we would be able to cancel our operations and negotiate. A request for negotiation never materializes. Instead, led by the United States, an unstoppable wave of retribution begins. For the Japanese military, it will bring a series of humiliating defeats. For the Japanese people, it will be a descent into hell. June 4th, 1942, Midway Atoll. A tiny but vital naval base in the North Pacific. Japan's Imperial Navy does not have the resources to defend two huge oceans. It has already lost one aircraft carrier and had two disabled at the Battle of the Coral Sea off the Solomon Islands. Admiral Yamamoto plans to initiate a huge naval battle at Midway that will neutralize the US Pacific Fleet once and for all. 
Unfortunately for him and his fleet, the Americans have broken the Imperial Navy's communication codes and know his plan of attack. The two navies clash in a huge carrier-based battle from the skies. The codebreaker's intelligence allows the US fleet to ambush Yamamoto's task force and he suffers a catastrophic defeat, losing four aircraft carriers. It is the decisive turning point of the Pacific War. A year earlier, Yamamoto had expressed his doubts about the outcome of the war to Fumimaro Kono-e, Japan's Prime Minister. In the first six to 12 months of the war, with the United States and Great Britain, I will run wild and win victory upon victory. But then, if the war continues, I have no expectation of success. They are prophetic words. The first Allied attack against Japan's Imperial Army begins in August 1942, with American, Australian and other British Commonwealth troops landing on Guadalcanal and other islands in the Solomons. The battle is ferocious and lasts for over six months at a cost of 40,000 lives, over 30,000 of them Japanese. A war of attrition begins as both sides fight for control of the vital South Pacific route to Australia and New Zealand. Guadalcanal finally falls to Allied forces in February 1943. A period of relative stalemate follows as the Allies, particularly the United States, use their vast economic resources to build an unassailable arsenal of weaponry and manpower. By June 1944, the United States and its allies are ready to go on the offensive once more. 535 ships and 130,000 US Army and Marines attack Saipan in the Marianas. A vital target that, if captured, will put the Japanese mainland within reach of American B-29 long-range bombers. The battle lasts for three bloody weeks, culminating in a mass suicide charge by the Japanese defenders, including civilians and wounded. Of the Japanese garrison of 31,000, only 920 surrender. There are over 5,000 suicides. There are 3,000 American dead and 10,000 wounded. Lieutenant Shin Hasegawa, an infantry officer. Any question of justice is no longer an issue in this war. It is an explosion of hatred between national groups. Neither side will stop fighting short of their total self-destruction. How shameful. July 1944. Only a few weeks after the horror of Saipan, another bloodbath occurs on the nearby island of Tinian. There is another suicide charge and over 8,000 of the Japanese garrison of 9,000 die. 
The Americans turned the island into six huge runways for bombers to attack the Japanese mainland. Iweo Okubo, a veteran from the war in China and previously a staunch supporter of Japan's military expansion, is now disillusioned. Our leaders must have known that victory was impossible against the Americans. They lied to us. Now the world has gone mad. We face total annihilation. Autumn, 1944. Japan is running out of experienced pilots. Its war effort is collapsing. In desperation, it decides to form special attack units. Divine Wind, Kamikaze, suicide pilots who will attempt to halt the relentless progress of the US Navy. Over 2,500 young men will sacrifice themselves by the end of the war. They will strike terror in the hearts of the enemy, but the US Navy is so powerful its onslaught will continue, unabated. May 1945. US Marines and infantry have landed on the island of Okinawa, where a fierce battle will rage for over two months. Pilots of Japan's Imperial Navy prepare to take off. Some of them are kamikaze, their mission, to destroy the American aircraft carrier USS Bunker Hill. With his wingman, Yasunori Seizo, Ensign Kiyoshi Ogawa, a 23-year-old pilot from the Gunma Prefecture, is assigned to the attack on the Bunker Hill. the Bunker Hill's deck, destroying all its planes, while Agawa's plane penetrates the deck, causing a huge explosion. The Bunker Hill manages to limp back to port for repairs, but suffers almost 700 casualties. Ensign Agawa's final letter home is recovered from his body. I will fly through those calm clouds with peace in my heart. I will not think about life or death. A man has to die, and no day is more honorable than today to dedicate myself for the eternal cause. I go to enemies smiling on this day and forever. Late May, 1945. The dominance of the US Pacific Fleet at sea and the United States Army Air Force in the skies means its fighters and bombers attack at will and wreak havoc on Japanese planes in the air and targets on the ground.
Akio Watanabe, a fighter pilot. We were just outnumbered. We lost so many good men. The Americans seemed to have an endless supply of men and machines. By the end, we were sending up boys who had almost no training in planes that were death traps. bombing of Japanese cities is remorseless. Its citizens are paying a high price for their leader's ambition. After months of heavy bombing, the country is in ruins. Defeat is inevitable. Firestorms rage and civilian casualties continue to rise by tens of thousands. The Imperial Army begins to withdraw from China. Okinawa finally falls in June followed by the Philippines in July. The bitter fighting on Okinawa has convinced the Americans that an invasion of the Japanese mainland by US forces would be a long and bitter fight, costing hundreds of thousands of lives. As a result, a momentous decision is taken. On August 6th and 9th, 1945, a newly developed weapon of awesome power is dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The two atomic bombs destroy both cities, bring death to a quarter of a million people and shock the world. In between the two detonations, the Soviet Union's Red Army invades Manchuria. Emperor Hirohito finally agrees to the unconditional surrender demanded by the United States and its allies. Japan's Seisen, its holy war, is over. Emperor Hirohito addresses the nation on August 15th. It is the first time the Japanese people have heard his voice. The enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bomb. The power of which to do damage is incalculable. It would result in the ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation. The hardships and sufferings to which our nation is to be subjected hereafter will certainly be great. However, we have resolved to pave the way for a great peace for all the generations to come by enduring the unendurable and bearing the unbearable. What Japan calls the Great Asia War has cost the nation over two million military deaths and over a million civilian lives. 
most of its cities have been reduced to rubble. Its infrastructure is in ruins. At least 20 million people have died in China and other parts of Asia that Japan conquered, leaving a residue of bitterness that will endure for generations. The terms of Japan's surrender mean that a once proud warrior nation will never again be allowed to indulge in its military prowess. The ultimate humiliation for a people so devoted to its samurai heritage. Many of Japan's leaders are tried and executed for war crimes, but the emperor and his royal family are granted immunity at the cost of renouncing his divine status. The greatest hardship falls on the ordinary citizens of Japan. It will take them many years to recover from the consequences of Japan's holy war.